Good day, and it's so good to be here with you again on this Thanksgiving weekend. And um, to all my Canadian friends, and I just want to wish uh, you a very happy Thanksgiving uh, weekend and happy Thanksgiving day. I pray and hope uh, this year that you've been able to spend some time this Thanksgiving with your family, your friends, and with your church. Uh, do not miss out on church on Sundays, folks. We've been missing out on a lot of that these days, and if anything, this world needs more of is faithful Christians that will bring the message of Christ into a dark world. But having said that, I thank you for inviting me into your homes. Thank you for following, and uh, I hope that it has been a blessing to you. I hope that you've been able to uh, understand the Bible a little better. I hope you've been edified by the messages that, that, we, that we preach uh, weekly. And uh, I pray also that you've been able to bless others in your life by the very presence of Christ in your life. For those of you who are watching that are not there, are not, into the, are not made that step, uh, I would encourage you to consider that. But I also would give a caveat that you would uh, take some time to count the cost. Uh, check out what Jesus says about uh, being a disciple of Christ in the Gospels. And uh, this is a pretty serious kind of decision. It is a serious decision, not kind of. It is a serious decision. So I would encourage you to do that. It's not something we should take lightly. But God bless you and, and God uh, keep you. And God, watch over you on this Thanksgiving weekend. Corrie Ten Boom, maybe some of you have heard of Corrie Ten Boom. Uh, she was a Dutch watchmaker and later, after World War II, because she goes back to that era, um, later became a Christian writer and public speaker. And during that uh, time, uh, 30s and into the war years, Corey and her family helped many Jewish people escape the clutches, if you will, of the, Nazi, uh, of the Nazi regime by hiding them in their family home. But unfortunately, the fateful day came and the Ten Boom family was arrested for their efforts in helping the, the Jews and also because of their involvement with the Dutch resistance of the day. It wasn't too long after their arrest that her father died while in prison, and eventually Corey and her sister Betsy uh, were sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp. It was there in the concentration camp that Corey and Betsy not only ministered to others, but came up and hatched a plan to create a place of healing, a place of restoration uh, for people after the war would end. Unfortunately, her sister, who had Failing health, eventually died, and just before Betsy died, she said to Corey, there is no pit so deep that he is not deeper still. Friends, there is no pit deeper, so deep that God is not still there. It's not deeper still. Boy, did I mess that up. Let me read that one more time. There is no pit so deep that he is not deeper still, and we'll leave it at that. Thank you for your patience. Over a week later, Corey was released and after her sister died and she gained her freedom. And later on, it was told that um, it was not more than a week after Corey's release that the women in her age group were all rounded up and sent to the gas chambers. Some might say, well, that was luck. Some might say that was happenstance. I would say that was God's hand for sure. But what you may not know... Uh, and then maybe it's not that important today, but I think it's important for us to understand that Corey and her family not only had great love and compassion for the Jewish people of, her, of their day struggling under the Nazi regime, but their love was not just for only the Jewish people. They, they, they shared the love of God with all. And they really focused on, Corey focused on the vulnerable in society. You see, the Nazi ideology not only targeted those who were uh, who they classified inferior due to race, but also people with mental disabilities and other disabilities. And the Nazis were killing people with mental disabilities and other disabilities due to these very uh, ideologies. And when Corey was brought up before her accusers, prior to, I, I suppose, being sent to Ravensbrück, 
uh, to give an account. She spoke about the kind of work she did with people struggling with disabilities, including mental disabilities. Of course, the Nazi ideology had brainwashed the, them into considering that as useless and worthless work, and they scoffed at her. But Corey replied uh, under, under a questioning by saying that in the eyes of God, a mentally disabled person might be more valuable than a watchmaker, which she was, or even a Nazi. Well, Corey's legacy of faith in Christ in the face of evil remains to this day. One time Corey said this, and I found this quite astounding and quite intriguing and really appealing to me. She said, don't bother to give God instructions, just report for duty. Well, today as we look at chapter 4 of Daniel, we will encounter one such person who reported for duty when facing a person who had ultimate power and authority over all in that day. Please turn in your Bibles to chapter 4 of Daniel as we continue our sermon series in Daniel, and we'll be reading the first 18 verses together. Daniel chapter 4, starting at verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty, is his, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in the bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me that they might make known to me the interpretations of the dream. Then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. At last Daniel came in before me, he who was named Belshazzar, after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you, for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. Verse 10. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw, I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its top, its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit, let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him, and let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end of the living, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowly list of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, O Belshazzar, tell me the interpretation, because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. The Lord bless the reading of his word. O Father God, we thank you. We thank you for another time that we can gather together wherever we are and whatever places we are and hear from your word. And as we look at Daniel chapter 4, as we look at what the king here has decreed or has accounted for, the experience he had with, uh, with Daniel and the experience he had with you, O Lord, I pray, God, that we would understand this and what it, its implications are for us today. Help us to know that, God, you are indeed sovereign over all, 
sovereign over all in every situation, over all the nations, over all governments, over every single circumstance. Sometimes our eyes, uh, we don't, in our eyes we don't understand that, we don't see that. Sometimes our hearts become weak, Lord. But help us to behold you, O oh Lord God. Behold you in our lives and in our families and in our world. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we start to look at chapter 4, my intent really was to, to spend some time with chapter 4 and 5 today. By the time midweek and later, actually Thursday evening, rolled around, things have changed, as it often does when I prepare. So as I mentioned at the beginning, our focus here is Daniel 4. And, and that's exactly what we're going to do. We find in Daniel 4 a first-person account. King Nebuchadnezzar is speaking here and describing a dream that had made him afraid. Verse 4 tells us it made him afraid. A dream that had come to him in the watches of the night, which had alarmed the king. Verse 5. But before we uh, probe further, uh, I do want us to notice that King Nebuchadnezzar began his account by praising God. We just read that together, verse 1 through to 3. And this was the third time in the book of Daniel that King Nebuchadnezzar praises God. The first time, if you remember, we found in Daniel chapter 2, verse 46 and 47, after Daniel had made known the king's first dream and its interpretation. The second time was when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked out of the fiery furnace unscathed, unharmed. We see that in Daniel 3, 28 and 29. And we find at the end of chapter 4, if you were to read through to that, and I hope you do, to get the whole context, we find the fourth and final time in the book that King Nebuchadnezzar praises God. And I think this brings us up a very valid question that we should probably deal with at first here today. Was the King Nebuchadnezzar saved? Was King Nebuchadnezzar saved? Well, clearly we see in the book here that God did whatever he could to reveal himself, uh, we find God revealing himself to the king in dreams, the first dream and the second dream here. God provided the prophet Daniel to interpret those dreams for the king. And God even demonstrated what the, what the king himself said, that the, the God is the God of gods and, and the Lord of lords in Daniel chapter 2, 47. And that the God is the one who the king said with his own, very own words, who delivered his servants, Daniel chapter 3, verse 28, from the fiery furnace. And here, at the beginning of Daniel, of Daniel 4, King Nebuchadnezzar even said that God is great. Great in his signs and wonders, not only to God's own people, but to a pagan king as well. So, was King Nebuchadnezzar saved? Well, we can't be certain. But as we look through some of the textual record here, we, might, we would probably come to the conclusion that he wasn't. But that's not the point. So, here's the point. By his own admission, this powerful ruler, this pagan king, following many other gods, acknowledged the sovereignty of the one true God. Folks, God is sovereign and more than capable to do what he pleases, when he pleases, with whomever he pleases, for his glory. If we don't get this from this story, we will not understand Daniel chapter 4 or even the whole book. King David once said this, as he lifted up his voice to the Lord, he said, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. You find that in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11 to 13. Friends, God is sovereign over all, in all of time, in every place, and is more than capable to carry out his purposes and will for his own glory. And then let's think about our context now as followers of Christ. Let's think about the state of the church today. The state of the people, the people of God today. And I wonder how, in our time, believers understand the sovereignty of God. Many others, more brighter and more 
uh, theological, if you can say it that way, than me have discovered and thought about this question about the state of the church today in these modern days. And one was, one was uh, theologian and pastor R.C. Sproul, who has now gone to heaven. He once said this, Most Christians salute the sovereignty of God, but believe in the sovereignty of men. So they sort of tip their hat at the sovereignty of God, but they really do believe in the sovereignty of man. Now, if there's any truth to this, and I believe it is, the church certainly today is in some serious trouble. But of course, I've digressed somewhat. Let's go back to the dream. Well, the king had this dream that disturbed him and alarmed him. And like me, many pagan kings of old, like King Nebuchadnezzar, called his spiritual advisors. And not unlike the first dream King Nebuchadnezzar have, happened, uh, King, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar had, pardon me, uh, these spiritual advisors were unable to help them. For, of course, they only had idols and gods of stone and wood. And it seems like there was a sense of relief when we, were, we read in verse 8 that at last Daniel came in before me. Here's these folks here. They're supposed to be my spiritual advisors and they can't help me. And then at last there's someone that's coming in I know can help me understand this dream. Moving along, the king described his dream to Daniel. We're not going to get into details here. We just read it. He dreamt of a large tree that a messenger from heaven ordered to be chopped down. Well, this is sort of the, the notes version. And the stump in the dream portrays a man who lost his mind and becomes like an animal in the field. But here in this description that the king gave of his dream, we find a key and very important verse, verse 17. Let's read that verse together. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he, he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. And we find this particular key verse, this key important biblical truth, repeated three, two other times here in Daniel 4, verse 24 and 32. Well, folks, what we find in these three verses, 17, 24, and 32, we find the support to our earlier discovery, don't we? God is sovereign over all things. For the heavenly hosts proclaim that. Secondly, these three verses highlight the judgment of God on the king. King Nebuchadnezzar had been judged by a holy and just God and would have everything taken away that God had given him unless the king acknowledged that God is sovereign and ruler over all the kingdoms of men, including his own. Well, you might be asking yourself, didn't the king begin his royal account by acknowledging that God is sovereign? Of course he did. We remember that he's giving an account of what happened before he came to his senses. God's punishment brought King to his senses. But there's so much more here that we can easily kind of skip by. So let's dig a little deeper. When we look at verse 19 and 27 as a whole, we discover a fantastic biblical truth. Folks, God is merciful. God is full of grace and mercy. And the Bible describes God's mercy all over the place. But let's just look at one. Let's look at Micah the prophet and what he said in his, in his prophecy. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. That's Micah 7, 18 to 19. Look at here. God is steadfast in his love. He is steadfast in his compassion. And he will take care of the iniquities. And we see that fulfilled, of course, at the cross where Christ came and died for the sins of the world, died for your sins and my sins. That will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. We see God's mercy, this beautiful grace, this mercy, 
was extended to King Nebuchadnezzar because as one commentator put it, put it, he put it this way, God's mercy is shed upon those who need it. And all of us, you and I and everyone, we are in need of God's mercy each and every day. For the Bible teaches us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's what the Apostle Paul said to the Roman church in chapter 3 of his letter. And God had withheld his just condemnation of King Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel, the prophet, the faithful prophet, a worshiper of the one true and just and holy God, after he interpreted the king's dream, said to the king, O king, let my counsel be accepted to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. Verse 27. What Daniel was doing here was echoing again another prophet that we could point to, Micah again, where Micah said in Micah 6, 8, he has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. There's so many accounts, so many accounts of some very evil people in the Bible that were transformed by the mercy of God. We see Jesus in his ministry when addressing the crowds, sometimes he would point to the scribes and the Pharisees who in their pride and their arrogance used God for their own power and gain. Stuff that, hap that happens so often today as well. You see, these, uh, these rulers, these religious rulers of Israel, they strutted their self-importance around everywhere they went. They wanted the green room. They wanted the limo from the airport. They didn't want to talk to the you know, the everyday Christian. They expected to be called rabbi, given the best seats at the supper table and be greeted with respect in the public square. My friends, Jesus saw through these self-made religious fakes. He told the crowds to observe, to observe and do what the scribes and the Pharisees told them to do because they were appointed by God, but not the works that they did. For Jesus said, you have only one instructor, one teacher, the Christ, the Messiah. Then he said what then and is today a revolutionary thing and a beautiful picture of the kingdom of God. He said, Jesus said, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. You'll find that in Matthew 23, 11 and 12. Humility. So there's four, four important biblical truths that we have found in King Nebuchadnezzar's account. One, God is sovereign. Two, one day God will judge the living and the dead. Three, God is merciful. James, in his letter, puts it this way. Mercy triumphs over judgment in James 2.13. And four, but not the least, God will humble the proud. God will humble the proud. Proverbs wisdom reminds us that one's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Proverbs 29, 23. And the Bible tells us that one day, that every knee, every knee will bow before the Lord. Well, back to our story. The question remains, would the king humble himself before God? Would he bow before the Lord? Would he acknowledge God and practice righteousness? Would the king extend mercy to the oppressed? Would he receive the mercy of God? Well, now we turn to the last verses, 28 to 37 of Daniel 4. 4, of Daniel 4. We already mentioned that Daniel was a faithful prophet of God. He brought God's message through the king's dream. And he said to the king, humble yourself before God. Acknowledge God who is sovereign even over your kingdom, King Nebuchadnezzar, even over your life. Well, what did the king do? He did nothing. 
The text tells us in verse 29 that 12 months went by after this encounter. 12 months went by. Now, one year might not seem like a long time, and it certainly isn't in maybe a lifetime. We know that the Bible teaches that God is long-suffering. We think of the 120 years of God's patience with the people of Noah's day. 120 years of Noah's witness an opportunity to repent, and then the flood came. We think of Pharaoh during Israel's captivity in Egypt. God would have relented with the plagues if only Pharaoh would have let people's, God's people go. We think of the, of the nation of Israel time and time again. God sent prophet after prophet to his people, didn't he? With one message, repent and turn back to God. And time and time again, they refused to turn back. And then the captivity in Babylon for 70 years. We think about our culture again, our, 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 not our culture, but our, our church today, the state of the church. I go back to that. And it's not hard to find uh, Christians and teachers, pastors, theologians who have divorced themselves from the Old Testament. And why have they done that? They've done it for many reasons. But one is that in the Old Testament, we have God who is angry and he's quick to judge. And I ask one question, really? Really? Is God quick to judge? The one and only uh, just and holy God could have decided any time in human history to end it all. You think God needs you and me? God doesn't need anything from anyone, anytime, anywhere. My friends, God is indeed long-suffering and patient with the sinful lot called humanity. But as we will see in a moment here, we should be mindful of this, to understand, to hear the word of God. For today is the day of salvation. Do not put it off till tomorrow, for tomorrow may not come. Well, back to our story. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of one of his palaces, surveying the grandeur of the city, and indeed, according to his history, Babylon was a, uh, was a wonderful city, beautiful city, architecturally, etc. As he was walking around on one of his palaces, I think he had three there in his city, I'm not sure. Sounded like that when I studied it. He said one too many personal pronouns. King Nebuchadnezzar said, I have built, number one, by my mighty power, number two, for the glory of my majesty, number three. This was the king's answer to God's offer of mercy. The ungodly and unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. It must have been something to see. A powerful king, ruler of the known world, brought down so low. So low that nobody would recognize him. King Nebuchadnezzar lost his kingdom when God took his sanity away from him at the drop of a hat. Why? Because the king refused to bow down, to acknowledge God as sovereign in his life and his kingdom. Why? Pride. You see, the self, the self-made man, the self made king, was king of his heart, and God had had enough. The text tells us the king hadn't even finished his proud speech when immediately, immediately, the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men. He was driven from among men. Well, let's bring it to us, to you, to me. A question, I have a question for you. Is your God too small? Is your God too small? Author Scott Hubbard said this, the promises of God often lose their power in our lives because God himself has become small in our eyes. You know, it's an interesting and disturbing characteristic of our fallen nature that our hearts are prone to wander from God. Our hearts can become cold as ice toward God. And you see, it's not that God changes, we change. 
We forget so easily. We get distracted so easily and so quickly. Discouragement and trials and all sorts of things come into our lives and it robs us of our assurance. And in the end, the promises of God no longer seem to have the power to still our hearts, to calm our hearts, to soothe our worried and anxious minds, to remove our sin and guilt. We, like the exiles in Babylon of Daniel's day, we need God to come alongside us and remind us of his promises so we can say, as Isaiah proclaimed, Behold your God. God had brought King Nebuchadnezzar down low, so low. Pride, not insanity, brought this king down low. Pride in our hearts will bring us down low. Our heart will grow cold to the things of God. And friends, a heart full of pride will have no room for the promises of God. Remember point number one. God is sovereign over all. You see, this was King Nebuchadnezzar's problem. His pride told him that he was sovereign over all. It told him a lie. You see, in God's kingdom, the humble are lifted up. Jesus said that. And in the days of Daniel, the one with the biggest and the best armies were lifted up. Today, in our world, the smartest, the wealthiest, the popular, the powerful are lifted up in our culture. The ones who have it all together, these are lifted up in the culture. We see this in the culture. We see this in a church. But in God's kingdom, Daniel reminds us, the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. Apostle Paul, boy, would he know about pride. He, he put it this way in the New Testament contest. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Chapter 1, 27 and 28, Paul said this, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human, might, no human being might boast in the presence of God. Friends, it is because God did these things that you and I are in Christ Jesus, it's a miracle. For we are prone to wander and be away from God because of our sinful nature. God did these things so that you and I are in Christ Jesus, who according to Paul became our wisdom from God. Christ is our wisdom. And more than our wisdom, Jesus became our righteousness and our sanctification and our very redemption according to Paul. God, thank you so much. Is your God too small? Check your heart. What's in there? What's filling your heart? What's filling your mind? Fear? Are you spending more time on the news than in the Word? Are you spending more time on social media, chit-chatting way? Have you bought in to the ways of the world? Has your heart become cold to the ways of God? Maybe pride has so filled your heart, there is no room anymore for Christ. Oh yes, your salvation is secured, but your heart is hardened. Well, at the end of our story today, King Nebuchadnezzar lifted up his head, lifted up his eyes, it, heavenward, and God restored him. We don't know what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar other than what history tells us. But God's amazing grace can transform the hardest of hearts. The king came to his senses, and we can read these, these words of his. I bless the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. Dear friends, it's time that we lift our eyes heavenward and say with the prophet Isaiah, Behold our God. Father God, thank you so much. We behold you. We lift up our eyes and our hearts heavenward. Oh, fill us with your spirit today. Give us your strength in these days. Give us your word in these days. Give us you in these days. Set us aside. Humble us, O oh Lord, and lift us up. 
for we desperately need that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being, well, having me in your places. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving. God bless. Shalom.